in the studio. I am so excited to have Representative Ruben Gallego. How are you doing, sir? Doing great. I'm just curious, since the last time we talked, what's new? Like, um, what are you working on? Oh, Lord. Uh, let's see. Well, to begin with, a lot have been focusing on uh, veteran issues. You know, it's a very big thing in our district, um, you know, especially since the VA uh, scandal at the uh, hospital. So I've mm-hmm. been working a lot in terms of some of the reforms that need to take place there. Uh, and then... Really now we're moving into a new era with uh, Donald Trump being president. A lot of what we're doing, at least I'm doing, is trying to keep him in check. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's very, uh, it's very important that the, we understand that the reason the Constitution was created, you know, and designed by the way it is, is to keep, you know, every, everybody in check. And now it's especially important. So trying yeah. to keep accountability uh, in the president, uh, you know, requires a lot of time, a lot of effort. Uh, but but we're we're doing it, and I think this country's gonna be better for it. Um, how dysfunctional is Washington with Donald Trump as president? I'm just curious. <laughs> it's very dysfunctional in some areas. For example, he hasn't really staffed up, you know, with oh, the wow. kind of professionals you need to run a functional government. Okay. Um, you know, for example, like some of the important people you need: the State Department, Treasury, uh, FEMA, the Homeland Security area. These are things that you know, whether you're a Democrat or Republican. You know, you need to put aside your partisanship and say, I want to have functional government, right? Because, right. you know, mm-hmm. when you deliver aid to somebody that's been flooded, it doesn't matter if it's a Democratic policy or Republican policy, True. it needs to get done. Well, right now, you don't have anybody, and that's very tro- wow. troubling for us. So, you know, we're, we, uh, especially me being on the Armed Services Committee, uh, I'm constantly pressuring uh, the White House and the executive to fill these positions, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to the Armed Services, uh, the uh, Department of Defense, because there's a lot of people... Uh, and especially their expertise that's missing right now. Hmm. Um, you know, I think a lot of us are very surprised considering that the Republican Party has full control of unified government, so they have Republican House, Senate, and presidency, mm-hmm. but that they're still very dysfunctional in terms of their agenda. Um, we're about to hit the debt limit. There's no guarantee oh, that... Wow. Yeah, there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to increase the debt limit, which is probably going to throw us into default, which will probably ruin the stock market. We, as uh, Democrats and and some Republicans, just want a plastic clean debt limit because the last thing you want to do when the economy is kind of shaky is create that situation. And that is what may occur, and not because of us, and not because some of these moderate Republicans, but because some of the more conservative elements of the Republican Party Hmm. uh, have a problem with the debt limit. And that could be really really bad for our economy, really, really bad. Yeah. Um, I remember you went down to... uh uh, Representative McSally's district. <laughs> yeah, I did. What was that like? Because I, I know you went down there basically to just kind of... Well, it, it was yeah, it was great. I mean, I think people were very appreciative that we had a, a you know a member of Congress that was there to talk uh, about the health care bill, what was going to, what was being proposed and why we should vote against it. Um, you know, Martha McSally is a great, you know, member of Congress, but mm-hmm. she was not uh, being accountable to her constituents. She was avoiding having town halls when you're about to basically affect, you know, the, the insurance of, uh, the health insurance of, you know, potentially, you know, almost 280 million Americans that are on the private right. insurance market. Uh, One-sixth of the whole economy was going to be reordered uh, mm-hmm. by this health insurance bill. And uh, she, and, and not just uh, uh, Martha, but lots of Republicans were voting town halls mm-hmm. and just wanted to pass this in the dead of night and, and without po- po- proper review. Uh, in terms of the Congressional Budget Office review, and it's actually that's what happened. And in the end, what what ended up occurring was it was too much weight and pressure being brought down on the senators, and they, and finally it was stopped. Um, but it was it's a very dangerous tactic to be able to, to try to change, you know, essentially one sixth of the U.S. economy in thirty days without you know actually understanding what you're voting for, and that's exactly what she did. Hmm. I I heard that they're trying to like reintroduce that again. But but is it going to actually be a functional bill this time? I I don't uh, I don't see that happening. I think they're going to try to make attempts to to reintroduce something. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem with with this health care bill, and I would say so called health care bill, is that it feels to me that it's not really a health care bill. It's a bill that's designed to first give a tax cut and then to take away health care from people. Mm-hmm. So under no matter what standard you use, if your bill at the end of the day causes more people to lose health care and premiums to go up, you really can't call it a health care bill. If the only net result of this is lower taxes, then you right. should just call it a tax bill. 
Um, so no matter what bill came out, whether it was the Republican version or the Senate Republican version, there's going to be people losing health insurance, uh, especially here in Arizona, where we had you know one of the largest expansions of Medicaid in the country. You would have had potentially hundreds of thousand people, poor people, losing health insurance. And to me, I, that was just unacceptable. You can't take away health insurance from the poorest people to give tax cuts to the richest people who don't need it. That was just ridiculous, and, and that's one of the reasons why I was so strongly against it. Okay. Uh, let's shift gears for a second. Um, I'll call him the president. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's the he president. Is, he is the president. He's the president. Um, president Trump recently, um, I guess, unveiled an immigration plan, if you right. want to call it that. Um, it seemed really incoherent. <laughs> but, well, I mean, that's most of his policies, yeah. Yeah. Um, if that were to become law, do you see that actually becoming No, law? It's, it's never going to become law. He only did that to really, like, get his base excited because they, they've been nothing but losing, right? They lost mm-hmm. the health care bill. He's not doing so well. People are, are starting to doubt him uh, about whether or not he was involved with uh, Russia and collusion. So they just decided to, like, throw this out there knowing that it's never going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, it won't pass the Senate. You need four, you need uh, 60 votes. You don't have the 60 votes. Right. You know, it probably wouldn't pass the House. But it gives something to his you know, really xenophobic base that really wants something like this. But, you know, let's be honest, that if he did pass that immigration bill, it'd be horrible for the economy. Mm-hmm. It'd just be horrible for the economy. You're dropping legal immigration by yeah. 50%, um, and somehow tr- saying that we're going to replace it by this, like, standard, uh, as if, you know, to try to bring skilled workers, as if, you know, all work isn't skilled. You know, and I really hate this idea that, like, some sk- work is not skilled or not. Like, yeah. I worked at... You know, meat packing factory growing up. I worked as a carpenter. I've worked as a uh, as a line cook. Like that takes skill. Like don't don't tell me it doesn't. And these men and women that come here and to to work in this country that work these jobs are skilled. And they, more importantly, they produce children that are amazing Americans and end up being great contributors. And if you look at you know Silicon Valley, majority of Silicon Valley is started either by immigrants or the sons and daughters of immigrants. Yeah, I mean exactly. like. Google, for example, is, is a good example. Mm-hmm. Um, let me see, um, you know, Tesla, that's another good example. You have a lot of these examples. And, and uh, you know, with the, the biggest driver and motivation for people to come to the United States is not because they're already high-skilled. Most of the people that are high-skilled stay in their country because right. they're, they're very well employed. Mm-hmm. The people that come to this country are the people that drive for a better life. And you cannot measure that by any test or by any, uh, you know, any degree. Mm-hmm. What are the... Um the current statuses of DACA and DAPA, because I know it, it impacts quite a few Absolutely. young people in, our, in the district here. Absolutely. So DACA right now is being uh, potentially reviewed by the Supreme Court, and they could come down with a negative decision in September, stripping the protection from almost one, one million uh, DACA recipients. In the House, what we've done um, in the Congressional Hispanic Caucus is we've introduced our own DACA bill, okay. which mirrors the, the Senate DACA bill. And the idea behind that is that we want to introduce something because should that Supreme Court case come down, we want to have something on file so we could try to force a vote on the floor Mm -hmm. Uh, and by what's called a discharge petition, which means we go around Paul Ryan, Mm -hmm. we go to these Republicans that claim to be Mm pro-DACA and say, like, if you're pro-DACA, then sign this and get this on the floor and protect these millions of people or Mm -hmm. uh, men and women. Um, And the Senate seems to be more... uh, uh, accepting of, of a DREAM Act proposal, we need to get into the House, and I think it's going to require a lot of people. I'll tell you, if, if the Supreme Court comes out against us, we need not just DREAMers, but all of the people that care about DREAMers and their allies to come down hard on on every Republican and encourage them to sign on to the discharge petition so we could vote this up or down. Mm-hmm. No hiding behind, well, if the vote comes to the floor, I'll vote for it. No, you can force this vote. Anybody can force a vote. Is, is there any, do we know when that decision might come down? Mid to late September. Okay. Hmm. I'll have to check on that. Yeah. Um, just if you could speak on how will that negatively impact people? Because, I mean... I mean, just... First of all, I think let's just look at the historical aspect of what we are doing. What an embarrassment to our country and to our future when we're going to look back and realize that we, you know, essentially deported a million, you know, people, Americans, and their family, uh, because we had a, the cowardice of Congress that couldn't do anything. 
And it's just think about, you know, if you look at the history of the United States, what do we regret? The biggest regrets we have are when we've caused injustice against a, a fellow man, which is counter to what we thought were American ideals, right? Mm. Um, you know, the annihilation of, of American Indians, displaced American Indians, slavery, how we treated uh, African Americans, you know, after slavery and even to now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, women, how we treated women until, well, even until now. But like, it's always been, it's the reason like we look back, um, you know, uh, how we treat Japanese Americans uh, and when we, we put them in uh, internment camps, the reason we regret those things is because we look at it now and we realize that that is counter what we understand the spirit of, of America and the mm -hmm. values of America. Right. Let me tell you, we do this, we're going to regret this for the rest of our lives. Just because, just not just because, but for one of the main reasons why, because it is counter to American values. Mm -hmm. The idea that we're going to deport good people that just want to be Americans because politically we couldn't uh, get our stuff together is ridiculous. Number two, it will impact the economy. These people own homes. They, own, they have jobs. They have businesses. They have families. You're going to just suck them out of our economy all of a sudden. You're going to have some very negative effects right away. Hmm. And lastly, I think it's going to be it's going to be a bad precedent. The only reason we're doing this is because there's a strong xenophobic base in this country, uh, and they are mad. And they're mad for many reasons, but you know, one of the main reasons they're mad is because this country is changing. It's not a lily white country anymore. Uh, I think we're becoming a more diverse country, and I think we should be very proud of that, and that makes us much stronger. Right. But because of that, it's really threatening a lot of people, and they want to see quote-unquote results. And their idea of results is separating families and, and kicking them out of this country. Um, we should not be encouraging that type of behavior or thought. It's mm -hmm. disgusting. It's anti-American. And... Um, you know, we need to push against it because it sets a bad precedence in terms of our what we accept as values of this country. I, I have a question, mm -hmm. and I, if I recall, you weren't in the House at that time. Okay, um, I think you were in the State Senate. But how much of this, um, of these problems that young DACA and DAPA recipients are, are going through, is the result of Democrats being inactive when President Obama had the opportunity with you know a Democratic majority? to possibly change this or to create, you know, policy or a yeah. law? Well, it certainly um, was a mistake for the president not to do conference immigration reform first over health care. I agree. Um, I mean, you know, on one side, I'm glad that there's millions of people that have health care that didn't have it. I, at the same time, I think you could have done both. I don't know why you had to do one or the other, like this idea that you have to concentrate on one versus the other. You know, it's ridiculous. Um, and that was a big mistake, and I think it's something that we regret. Uh, for a while now. It also takes two to tango. Let's not forget that we did try to pass a, a DREAM Act and True. was uh, filibustered uh, in the Senate, including by Senator McCain, mm -hmm. right? And that was very sad that that happened. Uh, there was like three Repu Democrats that joined in on it to filibuster, bad on them, but also, you know, there was a majority of Republicans that filibustered. And that's, that's unfortunate. Had that actually happened, we wouldn't be dealing with this problem. Um, and so the president took a secondary step, which is to do this by executive order. Um, but the biggest regret is the fact that uh, Secretary Clinton didn't win. We wouldn't be having this problem if Secretary, Secretary Clinton had won. We wouldn't have this problem right well, now. technically she did. But. Right, exactly, yes, <laughs> you're correct. Uh, and we wouldn't have this problem if uh, the president was treated with respect and allowed to pick his Supreme Court mm -hmm. justice. Let's forget Justice Garland would be on the Supreme Court right now if it wasn't for Republican obstruction, which is... Uh, you know, historical in the sense of what they did to this president. Mm -hmm. The fact that they stopped him from getting a Supreme Court nominee. And, you know, I also blame the Senate Democrats um, for not shutting down government. They should, as soon as the Republicans said, you're not getting your Senate nominee, I would have just shut this whole thing down, right? But for some reason, it's okay to pick on President Obama. They would never let this happen to any other president. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really, I'd say, like, that was probably one of the saddest things I saw and definitely a... Um, uh, a, a missed opportunity, and and a lot of that has to do with uh, you know bad democratic leadership. Mm. For people that want to kind of stay connected to you and and kind of follow what you're doing, how can they do that? So several ways. Um, you know, I've uh, follow me on Facebook, uh, and there's I have two Facebook followings. So I have my official, which is Rep. Ruben Gallego, okay. and largely that'll give you an update what's going on in the office. And then I have a political page, which is like you know. Uh, uh, R Ruben Gallego, just R-U-B-N-G-A-L-L-E-G-O. On okay. Twitter, uh, I have the same thing, Rep. Ruben Gallego, 
is my Twitter handle, um, and that's uh, giving you official positions of what I'm doing, what I'm saying. Uh, the more fun one is my personal one, okay. and that's at Ruben Gallego, R-U-B-E-N-G-A-L-L-E-G-O. And that's when I can be have, just be unvarnished when it comes to my uh, opinion. Okay. Last time uh, we ended the conversation, you were talking about, like, your favorite restaurant or yeah. something. Uh, do you have a new one? Do I have a new one? Okay, well, this always gets you in trouble because, you know, if you pick one restaurant over another, what I'll tell you is, like, new restaurants you can check out. Mm-hmm. In the, yeah, okay. That, I, I think that's what we said last Okay, time. new yeah. restaurants to check out. Let me see. What's the most recent one I got? You know, and I don't even go out that much just because they keep me really, really busy. Um, well, you know, one place to check out, not, not necessarily for uh, food, but for good uh, libations is uh, Gracie's. Okay. Uh, uh, Tax Tavern, I think it's called. It's on like 7th Street and McKin- 7th Avenue McKinley. Okay. It's a it's a it's a little it's a little hidden, but it's actually really good. Yeah, yeah definitely check that out. Uh, I see there. I think it, I've actually passed that. Yeah. When I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. You wouldn't be able to tell that there's a a, a bar in there, right? Uh, okay. Um, there, what's a new place over there in City's K Malo Chicano? Chicano. Yeah, I think yeah. I, I think I know what you're talking. I, about. I ate there a couple of times. I I really enjoy it. Okay. Um. And uh, Grand Avenue, um, uh, Savannah just opened up, and Savannah Esparza just wrote, put up her new restaurant called Grand Reserva. Hmm. It's been really good, like really good um, organic uh, food. And I'm um, trying to think what else is the latest ones I went to. I don't know, last time, uh, Santissima was around last time, but now they actually expanded, so you can actually sit down, which I think is some of the best tacos in the valley, too. Well, closing question, uh-huh. and I thank you again for, for your time. My pleasure. Um, it seems like Democrats in Arizona are kind of getting their stuff together. Yeah. You know, we actually got rid of Sheriff Joe. We did. We did better than my, most of the country. Yeah. yeah, which is why when all my other relatives were, like, depressed, I was like, what are you depressed about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we did better considering a lot of things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have hope that that will translate into maybe some election wins in the next mm-hmm. election here? Well, you know, and I, I worked a lot on the on the last campaign and uh, stumped for Secretary Clinton all over the country. And, um, I, you know, one of the things I like to point out is that at, at the end, the full investment that we had mm-hmm. in Arizona was $2 million, right? Oh, wow. There was $25 million spent in North Carolina, and we performed better in North Carolina. Right, yeah. I can't even, this, I can't even imagine what they spent in Ohio. And we all performed Ohio. Hmm. And Iowa, for example, you know, got to spend so much money, and we did surprisingly better, way better than Iowa, too, in terms of how yeah, close to the only lost by, like, what, less than four points? Here? Yeah, she got yeah. almost three points, yeah. Hmm. And so, you know, I'm always pitching Arizona as, you know, we are a very good option, and we're a very cheap option. We have two media markets. Mm-hmm. We have two population densities. It's easier to, to campaign. Um and the Democrats need to find a pathway to victory. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if we don't add uh, Arizona, then you're always going to have to run the table on Pennsylvania, Michigan, and all these other states. Right. So uh, by adding Arizona, you're op- op- opening up more avenues uh, to win, to win the, the presidency. Mm-hmm. Especially if you win Virginia, which I think will continue to win. Right. You win Virginia and you add Arizona, uh, I think you're almost at a victory, but, but, but close enough. So will we see maybe one day a Senator Gallego or a Governor Gallego? Not, not in this coming election. I'm, de- <laughs> I'm definitely not running in uh, 20, uh, what is, I don't even know what year, 2018, 2018 is the next time. Definitely not running in 2018 uh, okay. where, you know, for any seat that opens up. Uh, just, uh, you know, I'm really focused on being a good member of Congress, turning the state blue. I have a newborn. So oh, I got, congratulations. I get, uh, he's a great kid. I get to spend a lot of time with him. And, uh, you know, this is the very cute ages too they're very huggy mm-hmm. and stuff like that so yeah. like you know i don't want to miss this you know i could always go back later i got you yeah my my brother's two eldest sons just turned they're both teenagers now. yeah and so i mean they still like me because i'm uncle but yeah dad they're kind of like oh whatever exactly exactly <laughs> i want to want to be here when he likes me <laughs> cool well representative gallego thank you so much thanks for, for having me. me appreciate it you too thank you